Put your hands against my life What do you hear? A million words just trying to make The love song of the year my first vlog. I've never tried this thing before, but we'll have a go there, right, today. It's kind of a, a Q&A session, really. And if you want to know a little bit more about me, then here we go. Some of the questions will, they'll have like a long response to them, so bear with me. Uh, if you get bored, switch it off. Uh, especially the first two questions, they are going to be quite long-winded. I'll try to break them up and try to throw a few things in, okay, for you? I've never tried this before, so bear with me. Let's get on with the show. So, the first question is from Debbie. And a few, a few of you out there will know that I do photography. Not all of you will know that I, I've got a, I had a career in music for quite a long time. So here, here is Debbie's question. Well, two questions. First of all, how did you get into music? And here is a very long-winded answer. I got into music. Uh, I would say by listening to it when I was young and being intrigued by it and wanting to create it myself, which I've, I would think most other musicians, that's pre pretty much the same way. Uh, I got a guitar an acoustic guitar when I was eight and uh, I played I played that at school and I I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet because oh I didn't play trumpet I was quite good at it and I uh, got chosen to play at the town hall a lead guitarist at the town hall Oh, my grandmother and everything, she was in tears. She, and she's deaf. Well, she was deaf. She's dead now. God rest her soul. But, uh, <laughs> so it was guitar. But, the thing with that is, uh, the other kid, the other kids, they couldn't play like I could play. I'm not saying I was better than them, but the just couldn't play like I could play. And what they did play was other people's songs or music, whatever you want to call it, right? I, I, well, that's okay, you know. Uh, I had a guitar teacher called Mr. Mr. Sava, I think he was called Mr. Sava. And he taught us all um, Apache but by the shadows. Do you, do you know the one? But that, it just wasn't enough for me. I, I, I started right making my own music. And um, continued to do so with uh, as I got older with synthesizers, keyboards, computers, I was very much into the electronic side of it. Uh, it was only... 
I was mostly interested in music. I know this is going on a, a little bit, this first part. I'm going to have to break this up, probably. So, it, when I heard something on the radio, real, I didn't really listen to the words as such. I listened to the notation of the music, and I understood the notation of the music very well. And it wasn't till I was about, well, I wrote some songs when I was about 15, but obviously when you're 15, you've not really lived, so those songs are going to be pretty dull. Mind you, that said, when I was 38, they were still pretty dull. But it was about, when I was about 23, 24, something like that, when I really actually started writing songs to that as well, and I don't come, from, I don't really come from a musical family, but my grandmother was a brilliant writer and a, an extremely talented poet, and so, so was my father. Very intelligent people, and. I just, all, all I did was write my feelings down on a piece of paper and then put it to music and it seemed to work. It seemed to work and now I can write things without music. I can write poems or I can recall thing people who watch what I do on Facebook will have seen the stuff I do. Uh, writing music and writing words are phew, totally joined now. But I got into music because the short answer is I think that you, some people are born with a, some kind of creative urge inside them. And they have a desire to, to follow that and develop it. So I hope that's okay for you, Debbie. She asked another question as well. And what prompted you to make videos? Now, this, uh, this one isn't going to be quite as long. Now, since a fairly young age... Uh, when, particularly when me and my mates used to go to the Lake District camping or uh, sometimes on campsites or sometimes on the top of mountains and on, I've done all that bushcraft thing be way before Ray Mears was ever on television. I don't go in for all that consumerism bullshit at all. I've lived on the mountain for three weeks with nothing but these and the knowledge of how to survive up there. Um, I used to either borrow or hire the old school video cameras and, and make films and then come back and edit them and I was just interested in that too. Um, but this is connected to music. The, there isn't really a music industry anymore as such. I'm sorry to those people who still are hoping for success in the music industry, it, it, the, you've not got very much chance. There's, it's, not, there's, it's not there anymore. It's, it's gone. It's gone. <clears throat> Even you two have to give the records away. They can't sell them. And you're an unknown and you think you can sell your records. You can't. I'm sorry to tell you about that. But that's the way it is. But there is YouTube. You can make money with YouTube. Whether that be music videos, photography videos, funny videos, any videos. There is still a way to make money. So that is one of the reasons I make videos 
and I don't want to be rich, and my God, I'll never be rich with the with the earnings from YouTube. But if if it can just put a little bit of food on the table, that's that's okay with me. Plus, I enjoy it. It's creativity. It allows me to put together clips of things I've been doing to show to the world. That's that's what creative people do. That so it's within my my genes, if you like. So, Debbie, hope that one answers your question. Let's go on to the next one. Oh, this one's from Barry. These are really quite deep questions. What, in your opinion, would be the most amazing life? I can say this honestly now. The most amazing life for me would to have love, to have real love. And just that. To have a real love in my life. A woman to love me as I loved her. And spend her days and nights with me. And... I have had that over the years. But not quite the the X factor. He asks another question. And where would you live and why? Well, with or without that love, I I would I would like to live in the Lake District. Somewhere near Oldswater, in some kind of cottage near Oldswater. Perhaps I don't know how many of you know about Lake Oldswater in the Lake District. It's an amazing place. It's absolutely beautiful, and I could happily live there for the rest of my life. Yeah, people say, yeah, it's so beautiful you would get bored of it after a few weeks or something. I don't think I would. I, I I could happily live there, go photographing it nearly every day, paint, paint I'm into art as well as some of you will know. That's where I would live. In an ideal life, that's where I would live. Near Oldswater or in Patterdale, Glenridden, beside Locals water. That's where I would live. In England. He also asked this other question. In this new ideal life, would you keep technology or dump it all for a tech free life? That's a very good question. Because if you dumped all the technology and you were living in the Lake District, you could just live your own life and not worry about any, uh, like uh, social media pages like Facebook or things like that. But no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't dump away the technology. Absolutely not. In fact, I would encourage it even further. Definitely. I've always been interested in technology. I got my first computer when I was thirteen, and. Uh, my friends played computer games on their computers. I programmed them. They played computer games. I programmed them. Obviously, I played some computer games, but most of my time was spent programming. And not just computer games. Artificial intelligence programs, um, strategy games, all kinds of different programming, um, 
graphical arrays based on pi formula and all this kind of stuff. So, no, I wouldn't want to get rid of technology. I, I, want, I want more of technology. But, but what I don't like about technology is the consumerism of it that the likes of Apple bring into it. They are making those products for next to nothing and selling them for an absolute fortune and they have a whole bunch of followers paying ridiculous amounts of money to make them the richest company in the world and their technology is not very good their marketing could be said to be absolutely brilliant because they've nailed it there are in my opinion that that company is a wrong company to me and that's not the kind of technology I think is the future they're charging 600 and something pounds for a mobile phone all wrong to me that's not the future of technology one day I hope anyway at least people will wake up to the fact that Apple have been pulling the wool over people's eyes they'll never pull it over mine ever but they pulled it over a lot of people so there you go Barry that's that one. Oh, here's the, here's the next one what started your interest in photography well uh, also around the age where I was playing guitar and writing songs and making music and that I was also always interested in art as well and I went on a few school trips where uh, like two or three days away at a time we went to London went on a, one of these PGL adventure holidays for a few days and uh, my grandma paid for those those trips and uh, gave me a camera to take with me so that I could bring back some pictures. I was only like the first uh, the one in London I think it was about eight or nine or something like that and I came back and I showed the pictures and. Um, one of the, even my dad, who was never my biggest fan, and I was never his biggest fan, but I'm not going to go into that, said, did your teacher take these photographs? And I said, no, why? And he said, in, for, in, to his credit, he said, they're absolutely brilliant. How did you capture that image like that? And... and frame it so well and it just looks really professional are you sure you did that and I said yeah I'm absolutely sure I said well it looks brilliant and I never thought any more about that but I like painting um, drawing painting and all that kind of thing and I've only really got sort of more seriously into I've always had cameras though, but you know, not great cameras, or just the old school 35mm film cameras and that. Not the, uh, not SLR either, just compact 35mm, 30pound, 30 40pound throwaway cameras really. Uh, but I, I used to uh, try and do different stuff with him, uh, even like when I was 18 or 19, I remember like get my mates to jump off a wall so I could capture them pre flight in in flight if you know what I mean. So stuff like that and then when we had them because it was filmed then when we had them developed some of them looked absolutely rubbish and some of them looked brilliant. I always like to play around with that. But a few years ago I wanted to paint some more watercolours and uh 
I didn't want to just take a uh, paint a, a picture off a postcard reference or something like that. So I decided to go out and take some photographs as a reference to, to paint the picture from. And when and I went out and I took some photographs without really thinking about it too deeply. And when it came back, I, I had them printed out on A4. Uh, this now this now we're talking about the digital age. I put the SD card in at the printing station and I had them printed out on A4. And I think there's one of them. Well, there's one up there. And my mother said. You took these photographs. I said, "Yeah, yeah. I told you I was going and taking some, so I can paint, paint some pictures from." And she said, "You've really got an eye. You've really got an eye for that." And I, I didn't really realise uh, holding a camera for me is like holding a paintbrush, I suppose, or holding a frame, because I. When I hold the camera, I see a painting. And if I have to move the camera this way or that way or that way, whatever way, I photograph a painting. That's just the way I do it, automatically, really. So that's how I started to get into photography. And I, I absolutely love photography. And the, and I know more of the technical side of it now, but what I don't like is are the photography bores who want to go ah but what I saw did you say that it, it's either a good photograph or it isn't don't bore me to death just take some fucking pictures yeah and enjoy it I hope you other photographers out there will agree with that statement don't listen to the photographer boss telling you you've done this wrong. Uh, let people who know advise you, and I can advise anyone, for sure. But I will not bore you with numbers and figures, because the ones with the numbers and figures take the shittest photographs you've ever fucking seen. You can be a photographer without understanding how aperture, ISO, an exposure rate are linked. I know how they are, but you don't really need to know that to take great pictures. Just go out there and enjoy taking pictures and don't let the photographer boss stop you. Okay? That's my advice on that. Next question. <laughs> yeah, I did get this. I got this on. Uh, this one came from Facebook. Are you really gay? <laughs> I did, I said something on Facebook that there was, um, there was one of these Nigerian uh, scammers where they say they want to be your girlfriend and all that kind of thing. But, and they don't mess about. I mean, I mean the first thing they say is hello. And then the second question is, are you married? They, they waste no time. And then the third question is, what do you do for a living? They want to know what you... Hmm. <laughs> These are other questions I've had on Facebook. And some actually are on the YouTube thing. Are you mad? Watch this space. Here's another one. Do you take drugs? No. Nope. Not interested in them. At all. What is your star sign? That's another question I've had. What is your star sign? I'm actually on the cusp of Libra and Scorpio. Libra, 
the, the, the scales, the balance, and the camera is moving. What? Why are you moving? And Scorpio, the bit of the sting. Maybe that may explain a few things. I don't think Russell Grant, with his jumpers, could explain much more than that, though. Oh, here's another one. I get this one a lot, actually. I get this one a lot. Why are you single? <laughs> well, the, the short answer to that is because I'm not attached. So, you could say, to, well, why aren't you attached? <laughs> I've had quite a few relationships and uh, I'm at a point of, in my life where I don't know, maybe maybe I am ready for another relationship now. I definitely wasn't last year though. It really wasn't. I wasn't in the right place. I wasn't in the right frame of mind. Uh, but it's definitely something I would consider in the future. Uh, as I said at the beginning of this video, I really do believe love is one of the most beautiful things that Earth has to offer. It, and I'm not just talking on a, a sexual level because that's that's I'm just not that kind of person. Obviously, uh, if you're with someone, you're in a loving relationship. But I'm just I'm not one of those sort of pervy guys who goes on the internet or whatever and uh, that's just not me at all so maybe that's maybe that's something for the future uh, I, I, I had a very close mind about that in 2014 now in 2015 We'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I'm not going to try and rush into anything or... So we'll see about that. Uh, this, this, this is going to be a long one actually. And I get asked this a, a lot. And I'm going to have to give the short answer. I'll give the short answer to this. But if people want the long answer, I will give it to them. If people ask on this video for the full explanation, I will I will talk about it. Because uh, I've never really talked about this to, to many people at all. If, if anyone, really, in fullness. The question is, why did you never have children? Well... That's a good question. Uh, I am 43 now. Let's not pretend, you know, I'm 43 now. And I have never had children. Something a lot of people don't know is that I was with somebody for 10 years. You know, you know that kind of person that it, just almost every day is electric and the, it absolutely amazing you, you both and mutual you, you absolutely adore each other it's just electric <laughs> I'm glad I've got these glasses on um, a few things got in the way I'm going to have to make this as short as possible she made a few mistakes. She went on holiday to Anglesey for a week with her cousin, and um, I was working. I was working night shifts uh, on uh, mainframe computers at the time for a food di distribution company, and I was there on the computers at night, and I was waiting all week for her to come back and I couldn't wait and the day she came back uh, after I finished my shift so it was probably the day after actually I went back she was living with her mother 
uh, went to my mother's house and I said, oh, yeah, is, is Christine back yet, please? And my mother said, oh, I'm sorry, love. She's been, she has been back. She was back this morning, but she's gone again. And I said, gone where? She said, I'm sorry, David. She's, she met someone in Anglesey and she came back to get all of her belongings and she's fallen in love with someone else and she's she's gone to she's gone to Anglesey to live with him. Live with him, I said. David. I said what? She said no, his name's David. I said, My name's David. She said, well, so is this. I'm sorry, David. But she, she's now living in Anglesey with David. <sighs> that was rough. That was rough. And uh, shortly, I'm going to have to make this really quick. Shortly after that, I opened... Um, <laughs> Oh, time went on, time went on, and oh, uh, like maybe six or eight months later, I was in bed one night, and there was a knock at my door at about two o'clock in the morning, and it was a summer's night, it was warm, and I went to the window and looked out the window, and there was Christine, so I've mentioned the name, uh, okay, everyone knows now her name is Christine. And there she was in this beautiful dress, looking so stunning. Really, really stunning. I hadn't seen her for so long, and I, obviously, at two o'clock in the morning, really wondered what, what. And I, the place she came to, it was a long way from where she came from, so God knows how she got there. And, and, uh, I just got dressed and came out of the house and it was like like this little village green thing and we sat there and talked and I asked her why she'd come back and she had this big uh, diamond engagement ring on her finger and she said come back to tell you that I'm getting married soon. I said, why do you keep doing this to me? Why? She said, I just wanted to tell you that I love you. I really love you. And I want to tell you where I'm getting married on a what day. And I want to tell you that if you want to, you can stop that wedding. I said, oh really? How's that then? She said, I love you, not him. So you were in his ring. Been with him for the last eight months. He left me. She said, if you come into that church on that day, if you come in through that door halfway through the service, I will leave the church with you and call the wedding off. And I said, and I think it was right to say, the only person who has the right to call that wedding off is you. If you don't want to marry him, don't marry him. I'm not coming to that church and doing that. So, uh, 
I'm sorry about that. So, uh, we ended up spending the night together, actually, in a hotel, but we didn't. We shared the same bed, but no, not like you might think. And uh, um, uh, a few months later, I got a reminder, a letter from her, a reminder saying the wedding's coming soon. Just to let you know if you want to stop this wedding, so I ignored that. And months and months went past. And I, I, that night, I told her I was opening in a bike shop. The night when she came with the engagement ring, I told her I was opening in a bike shop, and I was. And I know. At 23 years of age, I opened my own bike shop, and I was quite proud of that achievement. And uh, she said, What are you going to call it? I said, I don't think I'm going to call it Spokes. All oh, right, where's it? Where's it going to be? I said it's going to be in Ashford Line near Manchester. Well, what would you know? About six months later, I got a phone call <laughs> to the bike shop. Hi, it's Christy. Hello. Uh, um. No, I'm going into the full long version, aren't me and now, aren't I? Right, I'm going to cut this short. You can have the full long version if you want. She got pregnant to him. She had the baby. They split up. <laughs> you saw that coming, eh? They split up. She came back with a child. Begging me to take her back and bring her child up as her own as my own sorry I got I was I was in a good job uh, working with computers again I got a house provided us with a house I looked after her when I wasn't working and she was working I looked after that little girl uh, as best I could I did nothing but good for her I came home from work one night, it was right near Christmas, two days, three days before Christmas, and I said, how's my two beautiful ladies doing today? And she said, I've got something to tell you, David. And I said, oh, wow. I wish I had a tissue. She said, I'm pregnant. Oh, God. I was del absolutely delighted. I, I really was absolutely delighted. She'd been, she, okay, she'd never played totally fair with me for certain amounts of time. But I was absolutely delighted. I just put my arms around her, I kissed her, and she said, whoa, 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 stop that. I'm not keeping it. I said, what? I can't keep it, there's too much going on. Dave, Dave, she now called him Dave, not David. Dave's given me loads of hassle over divorce and everything. I can't be handling having another kid now. It's just not convenient at the moment. I'm getting rid of it. I, I, I said, please... I said, I can't tell you not to do that, it's, but, I, I didn't, I couldn't say much more than that, really. How could, you cannot tell a woman to keep a baby if she doesn't want to keep a baby, even though that baby is part of you as well, you, you, you cannot tell them to do that, that, well, that's, that's my moral thinking about it. And I said, well... I, I really do find that a shame. I, I didn't kick off or wasn't nasty about it. And I said, well, if that's what you think you must do, then 
okay i'll have to support you with that let's just get through christmas and she said well what what do you mean get through christmas i said well it's only like three days away she said no i'm booked in the day before christmas eve for the abortion and then i'm going back to dave we're going to try and rework our marriage i said you've got to be joking she said i'm not joking and she got her stuff out of that house. She went and had my baby aborted. And she went back to that guy. And I was in that house on my own at Christmas. And I tell you what. That wasn't easy. That really wasn't easy. And so I nearly did have a child. And it made me more cautious in the future. Uh, let's say that much. I'm sorry that was a very long-winded account there. I was trying to make it short. There are, there's loads more to that story actually, but I tried to make it short. I apologise about that. There's some other things here that's quite long-winded. Uh, here's a more light-hearted one from, from uh, a close friend of mine who lives nearby and he asks who is the most famous person you have ever spoken to face to face now obviously with working in the music industry of the years I, I could mention quite a lot of names uh, Kim Marsh, for example, Robbie Williams, they're quite famous, aren't they? Um, worked with them both. Um, but I tell you one of the, I tell you one of the nicest, nicest famous people. I've met lots of famous people. And one of the nicest famous people I've ever met. And I've been to his house. And I've been to quite a few famous people's houses. Was Bill Tarney. That is Jack Duckworth out of Coronation Street. He's a lot, not a lot of people know this, but his real name, what is deceased now, God rest his soul. His real name was William Cleworth. Piddington. And how do I know that? Because he bought his grandson a BMX from my bike shop and he signed the cheque. William Cleworth Piddington. And delivered that BMX to his house. And an absolute gentleman, a brilliant singer, and just an all-round entertainer, just an absolutely amazing person. No bullshit with him, no bullshit. The real deal, not aggressive, not I am this or I am that, or just an absolute gentleman. I'd love to be a gentleman one day, but I think I've been too much of a C-U-N-T to ever be one, but I'll give it a try. But Jack Duckworth out of Coronation Street has to be, will remain in my mind as the most amazing, famous person that I have ever met. He was an absolute legend. I'm sorry it's not Keith Richards or Paul McCartney or something, but hey. It was Jack Duckworth out of Coronation Street. That guy was a tremendous guy. Real down to earth, absolute gentleman. A real pleasure to meet and talk with. Right, I'm going to switch this camera off now and I'll come back to the other questions shortly. I'm sorry about the long winded stuff there. 